This is an examination of the hidden human condition. This is the Hidden Killers Podcast with Tony Bruschi. When someone commits a horrible crime or is alleged to have commit a horrible crime, everybody starts to wonder, okay, well, what do we know about this person? What have they been like? What's their history? Does it fit a narrative for their behavior in the past? So Rex Hewerman is being examined and scrutinized and very much every public aspect of his life being put underneath a microscope for the allegations that he is the Long Island serial killer. And thus far, the uh, evidence that's popping up is scary and it's mountainous. There's been talk of his interactions with some of his clients of being very difficult and uncomfortable to work with. Nothing necessarily criminal in that whatsoever, but uh, showing not exactly the most personable of human beings from what we have learned thus far. Here now is audio of an interview that Rex did uh, with a YouTube channel a little while back talking about architecture. May point, uh, or not point, but may give us a little bit of insight uh, into his personality, but keep in mind he's on camera, he's being interviewed, he's he's on, if you will. He's in that place where, you know, you want to look good, so you're not necessarily going to come across as a you know, blazing asshole either. Anyway, this is the interview that's been talked about, uh, Rex Hierman of the Department of Buildings Consultant and the facilitator uh, being interviewed on YouTube just a little while back. Take a listen to it in its entirety. Bonjour, I'm Antoine. Today on interview, Rox Hoyerman, owner of RH Consultant, a department of building facilitator. Let's go meet him. Hello. Hi. How are you doing? Good to see you. Likewise. I hope you don't mind. I brought my assistant with me, Norman. Hello, Hello Norman. <laughs> I see it's raining out. Yes, Shall it's raining. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. please. Okay. I know. You said you'd like to do this outside, but Mother Nature is not cooperating today. Yeah, to say the least, I tell you that. Being... In your office, all right? I wasn't looking forward to doing this under a scaffold. <laughs> I can understand. Okay, anyway, let's dive in. So, uh, tell us, you know, who you are, uh, you know, where you're from, and how long you've been in New York. So okay. Like um, Rex Hewerman, I'm an architect. I'm an architectural consultant. I'm a troubleshooter. Born and raised on Long Island. Okay. Been right. working in Manhattan since 1987. Oh, wow. Very long time. Okay. So uh, this brings uh, directly to my first question. So, you know, can you explain to our audience what is it that you do, not the architect part of your business, but the other part of the business, which is it's my understanding that your kind of a facilitator with the Department of Building. Is that correct? But please tell us. That's correct, but much more. Okay. <laughs> what That's I do, much more I'm interested. I do troubleshooting, architectural troubleshooting, and negotiations with the building department. Okay. What I mean by that is, do we do the standard stuff with the building department? Um, handle your filings. Um, I have other clients who are a lot of other architects. Mm -hmm. And we'll handle their interactions with the building department, yeah. especially out of city architects because they're a little afraid of the city. And Stop when city. <laughs> when a job that should have been routine yeah. suddenly becomes not routine, yeah, I get the phone call. Gotcha. Whether it's an old building and they need somebody that understands and can maneuver the 1938 building code or the current building code. You look surprised when I say 1938 building yeah, code. Building, uh, yeah. um, I've actually used the 1901 old tenement laws here in the city of New York, and you can legally do so. Oh, wow. That's one of the little things that, that you do. people don't always understand when it comes to building codes. Yeah, yeah. They never read the administrative section. <laughs> So, uh, what, what decided you to launch that particular, I would say, a niche of a, of a business? Was it because out of uh, 
uh, frustration on your side as an architect. You say, I can't believe, you know, I didn't think about that. Let me dive into it and let me, uh, let me try to maybe make it a business out of it. Or was just, you know, you just decided to do it. Actually, it was Harvey's fault. Of who? <laughs> in 1987, when I came to work in the city, the first architect I worked for was Harvey Rosenberg. Okay. Great man. That year, a new law came out. Local law 58 of 87. Okay. That's all the handicap access. Oh, uh, okay. They said, Did you? You're the new guy. You read it. So... I read, you it. read it. There was a situation dealing with the city. They said, well, go meet with the city. I did. I was effective at it. He said, go do it again. <laughs> oh, that's funny. And that's how the whole thing started. Okay. And he did a lot of work with not for profit agencies okay. for developmentally disabled. <laughs> So that's where I started doing a lot of my building code, code consultant with him, as well as the design and drawings yeah. for these facilities. <laughs> and the one thing I learned very quickly was yeah. the building department could not understand them. Could not understand what? The, they, their own codes? The their own codes, their own <laughs> laws, because you have what we would call a group home for developmentally disabled. Okay. It doesn't exactly fit the code book. And the plan examiners who work for the building department didn't fully understand it. So part of my job became educate the city. So you educate the city about their own code. Correct. That has been, you know, our, our roles. That's been something we've been doing ever since and we still do today. So you started with a with a, a firm, and then when you decided to launch your own, you decided you are let me continue that route of the consulting. Is that correct? That's basically correct. Yeah. But the way it all happened was was a recession in the early nineties. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh, and yeah. we're all trying to figure out who to work for. Yeah. And that's when I met my very very first paying client, uh -huh. Robert Meyer. Robert Meyer, okay. I'm in the Queens building department. It's before lunch. I want to get to lunch. We're back in those days, you had to physically stand in line yes. with your paperwork because this predated the computer system. Yes. And he was dealing with the clerk at the certificate of occupancy counter. Didn't know what he was doing. I'm getting impatient. I go, excuse me. Took his paperwork explained to the clerk what he needed, then explained to him what he needed to do, then move over. Then I took care of what I needed to do. <laughs> he was standing off on the side. What do you think is one of the main reasons uh, people are contacting you? Is that because they were badly advised or because they Two, they don't know uh, all the rules or they try to rush things. Is that what, what is basically most of the reason why people are contacting you for? I would say the biggest reason, yeah. they're overwhelmed by the city. Mm. They're overwhelmed by the size, complexity of the building department. Yeah. And whether it's a restaurant, a place of assembly, um, a 40,000 square foot retail that we yeah. did last year uh -huh. or somebody's co-op or it's their mother's co-op and she passed away and there's an old application that's 20 years old that nobody addressed that they have to solve to sell it. People get very overwhelmed, yeah. not just by the agency and how to deal with the agency, but the complexity of we got plumbing work, structural work, construction work, there was mechanical work done. There's a list of requirements, 20 something things long in the computer. <laughs> what do we do? Okay. <laughs> so tell me, is this part of the, because you're an architect, uh, is this part of the business 
has outgrown your architect uh, business or it's he it started he started taking over or what it, sometimes it's the majority really yeah that's sometimes it's 50 50 with architecture depending yeah. on what i'm doing yeah on the architectural side having all of these capabilities in-house gives me an advantage over and other people because exactly. i have my own staff yeah most architects will go to an outside consultant like yours co- no not like mine oh. called an expediter ah okay and oh okay that's what the expediter the expediter is. they understand how to file they understand the administrative procedures where i exceed that is i have my i have the license to practice architecture so when i go to the city I can tell them what I, how I feel and what I think they should do. Yeah. And I do that. <laughs> um, an expediter can't do that because yeah. they work at the pleasure of the city. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't. Understand. Yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, you know, after all those years, what do you think uh, is the most import, important qualities a person uh, in, your, in your position uh, dealing with the DOB must have? Patience. That's funny. I, I, I was hoping you would say that. <laughs> yeah. Um, patience, and I don't like to use the word tolerance, but sometimes you have to. Yeah. And it's not just with the city. It's also with the client. Because yeah. most clients, they don't understand what I have to do, why I have to do it, what it takes to get done. Yeah. And when you're dealing with somebody in the city, whether it be a clerk at the counter who has to enter data entry, or if I'm dealing with the borough commissioner of Manhattan, you need the patience, because who knows what the person before you did. Sometimes they have very bad days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I've I've actually gone to the commissioner's office sat down in his waiting area yeah. at 11, 11.30 in the morning, and a little after 5 o'clock, I heard him finally holler out, is Rex still there? <laughs> That's how long I waited. Oh, God. Because that particular client, yeah. I had to see the commissioner. They were the only ones who could give us an answer. Okay, got it. Oh, John, so this is a perfect segue. Do you have a story where... Um, the situation, and we don't need names, but do you have a story where situation seemed, you know, very, very doomed, but you were able to deliver at the end? Do you have a, like, a, a good success story to tell us? There are so many different ways I'm of sure. looking at it. Um, <laughs> but you have one. Well, only only one. one. Okay. One of the first ones to come to mind. Yeah, go ahead. Was a building downtown Manhattan. Okay. They put a generator on the roof. Typical, generators go on roofs all okay. the time. Uh-huh, okay. Except the fuel lines to feed, the fen- to feed the generator will run through the exit stair. Let's ah. see. <laughs> Pumping diesel fuel through an exit stair, that generally is not a good idea. <laughs> this doesn't sound very safe to me. <laughs> no. And I'm not even in your field. <laughs> and we're talking a 20-something story building. Even better. Um, <laughs> The architect who I was working with at the time, I called him, didn't answer, I called him, to, I called him four or five times. He finally picks up the phone because he happened to be at Passover dinner. Uh-huh. And I told him what was going on. All I got was dead silence, then the, oh my God. Okay. Now, you would think, how do you solve this without yeah, you tearing that? everything yeah, apart? Yeah, exactly. yeah. Meet with the commissioner of Manhattan Building Department, and I start negotiating how to do this. Okay. And I got very creative <laughs> with first, you have to address I got flammable liquid, combustible liquid in my stair, not good. Can I separate it from the stair? Okay. That was question one. Second question is, Do you still have enough room for the legal means of egress in the stair? Because you have to maintain minimum widths, minimum capacities to get everybody out. Yeah. So this became a mixing of building code, negotiation, 
the use of modern <laughs> products to achieve all of this. And in the end, yeah. the pipe stayed. The pipe stayed. They stayed. I achieved a four-hour separation from the stair using autoclaved aerated concrete block construction. Uh, and on the Chinese to me, but I'm sure. And on the horizontal run, yeah. I used a 3M product to achieve the fire rating. So it became a mix of art and science. <laughs> <laughs> and the understanding of the code to make it work. Yeah. And wow. that's what I applied to each job. Um, I actually just purchased, this, purchased a copy of the 1922 building code. Oh. Because I'm dealing with a building that was built in the late 20s, but it's not yet under the 1938 code. So I'm in that slack water between 22 and 38, and I need to prove that the condition was legal at that point at in that time. At that point in time. That's which is why at home I have an extensive library. I'm sure. Of obsolete books. <laughs> and people want to know, why do I have a plumbing code from the 1970s? Yeah. Uh -huh. When I do work for either attorneys or have to look up something historical, yeah, yeah. I need the reference for that point in time. Exactly, yeah. What has this job uh, taught you about yourself? I think it's taught me more about how to understand people. Because dealing with the technical aspects Yeah is something a person can learn. Mm -hmm. You go to school and through an architectural program. You work for the experience of doing architecture. You get your license to practice. Yeah, yeah. As your time goes on, you learn about the buildings and about the codes and the different buildings of time frames. I'm dealing with a building from the 1880s right now. You know mm -hmm. how they react. But yeah. it's the people, how they're all so different and how you deal with the people, I think is one of the more interesting aspects that have come out of this. Yes, okay, okay. All right, my last question. If you were a tool or an object to help you uh, in your, uh, to help you to bring your business to greater heights, what would it be? That's an interesting question. I know. <laughs> Because for what I do, we have to have so many tools in the toolbox. Uh, just one. Just one. Just one. Or an object. It doesn't have to be a tool. It can be an object. You know what? Yeah. I know. All right. One of the things I learned from my father was furniture building. Okay. He was an aerospace engineer and built satellites. <laughs> and Runs in the family, yeah? building things. <laughs> and <laughs> built furniture at home. And I still build it in the same exact workshop. So? I have one tool that's pretty much used in almost every job. And it's actually a cabinet maker's hammer. Cabi oh, okay, and cabinet maker hammer. Okay. It is persuasive enough <laughs> when I need to persuade something. It Not someone. Something. <laughs> <laughs> and it always yields excellent results. Yeah. And at the end of the project, whatever piece of furniture or what I'm working on, it always helps it come out beautifully. Okay, great. So you would be kind of a, that kind of hammer for your uh, for your business. That's what you're saying. You If have that doesn't exist. That's what you would be. Sometimes I have to be the. <laughs> Heavy framing hammer? <laughs> the heavy framing hammer. Other times I'm the lightweight hammer just to <laughs> nudge things along. All right. I guess it's a hammer. We got it. That's it, folks. That was Rex, owner, founder of RH Consultant. So if you have any building regulatory issues, please contact him. He's probably going to solve your issues, okay? Uh, guys, you know the drill. Uh, comment, share, like. Subscribe, subscribe, very important. But in the meantime, it's... Selfie time. Selfie time.
You're fast. Ready? One, two, three. Ah! Can you smile? That is. You're consuming the Hidden Killers podcast. Want more? Start binging on all of our true crime podcasts right now through Apple Podcasts and get an ad-free experience when you sign up to be a True Crime Today Premium Plus member exclusively on Apple Podcasts. More of the Hidden Killers podcast dropping soon. Press subscribe now.